welcome to Food for Thought. My name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau from Compassionate Cooks. I founded Compassionate Cooks to empower people, to make informed food choices, and to debunk myths about vegetarianism and animal rights. You can learn more about who we are and what we do by visiting our website, CompassionateCooks.com. I also encourage you to check out our message board, which you can access through the website, through the Compassionate Cooks website. Also, if you would like to spread the word about this podcast, we now have a podcast sampler CD available in packs of 10 or 100. So many of you requested this, and I'm thrilled to say that we now have it. Thank you again to Marty and Wendy Beckers and Chris Marco for making it possible. And thank you to today's sponsor, Anne Gayor. I hope I'm saying that correctly, Anne. Anne actually dedicated her sponsorship to her friend Eileen Testa. This is the email I received from Anne. I just supported a podcast, and I'm not sure how to say thank you at the start. I haven't written to you before, but have been listening for the last two months. You inspire and educate, which makes you the type of teacher that all teachers should aspire to be. I would like to dedicate a podcast to my friend Eileen Testa. We grew up together in Buffalo, New York, not the most veg-friendly place, and she inspires me. During my 20s, I worked at the Candle Cafe in New York City. I was eating a vegan diet but had dairy outside of work. I then moved to Boston, got married, and when I was pregnant with my son in 2000, I started eating fish, turkey, and chicken again. Thought I needed it for the baby. Last year, I gave up meat again completely and just went vegan January 1st. I have never felt better, and although I am a happy person, I am even happier. I now love to cook. I never enjoyed cooking before. Could it have been that touching raw animal flesh disgusted me? Absolutely. Going back to Eileen, she has four amazing veg kids under the age of eight. She is an amazing runner who inspired me to run the Boston Marathon. She introduced me to your podcast, and she is my daily go-to person for cooking tips and all things compassionate. Eileen Testa is a bright light. Anyone who knows her will attest to it. She is a true hero. She lives her truth every day, and I am honored and humbled by her peace, light, and truth. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, Eileen, for being a light in this world. And thank you to all the monthly and one-time sponsors. I'm very grateful for your generosity and support. Please consider sponsoring the podcast if you are able. You should know that I am very proud of the fact that this podcast is completely 100% listener-supported, and you should be proud of that, too. I couldn't do this podcast without you, and so I need your help. All of their sponsors receive a little gift as a token of my gratitude, depending on the sponsorship level. Please visit CompassionateCooks.com and click on support our podcast today. And thank you very much in advance. I am very excited to do an entire episode on green leafy vegetables. My July 2008 cooking class is coming up, and it's a popular one. It's all greens. It was the inspiration for this particular episode. It's called Greens, Greens, Glorious Greens. And for three hours, we will be talking all about greens in the class. Not today. We won't be here for three hours today. But in the cooking class coming up for three hours, we'll be talking about greens. And the dishes that we're doing, I'm very excited about. They're some of my regulars here in my own house. We're doing kale and cauliflower salad with orange cashew cream, Swiss chard with caramelized onions, and we're making that as a pizza, greens with sesame miso dressing, borscht, which is beet soup, and we're including the beet greens, and pasta with dark greens and pine nuts. And recipes from this class will be available after the class is over, so look for them after July 19th, and this is 2008. I'm very excited. I'm very excited to talk all about greens. It was actually funny as I was writing this episode, I was getting really excited about having some greens and I didn't have any in the house except I had lettuce, but I really wanted some collard greens. So as I was in the middle of writing this episode, I ran to the store and bought some collard greens and made them for dinner last night. I know you've heard me gush about kale in the past, but I am here to gush about all things green, all different types of greens. 
And so we have a lot of other greens to talk about besides kale. And we're going to talk about kale again today. I aspire to consume a bunch of greens every day, one bunch um, of greens a day, at least every single day. And it's not that hard if you center your diet on whole plant foods, which I try to do. And calorie for calorie, dark green leafy vegetables are perhaps the most concentrated source of nutrition of any food. They're a rich source of mineral including iron, calcium, potassium, and magnesium, and of course vitamins, including K. We talked about vitamin K very recently, vitamin C, vitamin E, and many of the B vitamins. They also provide a variety of phytonutrients, so the plant nutrients, including beta carotene and lutein, which protect our cells from damage and our eyes from age-related problems, among many other wonderful effects. They're also great sources of fiber and folate. They're low in fat. They're high in protein per calorie. And dark leafy greens also contain small amounts of omega-3 fats. The evidence of the healthfulness of greens is overwhelming. I couldn't possibly tell you all of the human-based studies and research that support our need to consume lots and lots of green leafies. It's just amazing. I mean, just it goes across the board from protecting our bodies against a number of different cancers, to strengthening our immune system, to protecting our bodies against heart disease, to protecting our bones against degeneration, to promoting lung health, to lowering cholesterol, to enhancing our mental performance, lowering a risk for cataracts, um, protecting against rheumatoid arthritis, um, to helping the colon function properly, to acting as anti-inflammatories, to providing energy, just name it. We're talking about powerful, powerful powerful effects from the green stuff. So get the greens into your body. I don't care how you do it. Just get it in your body. Now, I've talked a lot about the benefits of consuming as many colors as possible because of all of the different phytonutrients. I keep using that word. They're just the plant, the nutrients in the plants, the phytochemicals, these, these plant nutrients, these antioxidants. They reside in the colors of the plants. These phytonutrients give carrots and winter squash their rich orange red color and they make beets that brilliant red. So I often say shop by color. When you're at the farmer's market, when you're at the grocery store, shop by color. The more colors you can eat, the more nutrients you're consuming. And when you eat greens, you're actually eating a variety of colors. Did you catch that? You're not just consuming green. If you think about what happens to leaves in the autumn when they change from green to yellow or orange or red, these colors are actually in the leaves year round, but they get overshadowed by the green color. The green is actually the chlorophyll in the leaves. So when you consume green leafy vegetables, you're actually consuming a variety of colors and thus a variety of phytonutrients. So what are these nutrition powerhouses? Well, technically, there are over 1,000 species of plants with edible leaves, and I clearly can't cover all of them here. 1,000 plant species with edible leaves. This is what I mean when I say that I am completely flabbergasted when people say, oh, so you're vegan, so what do you eat? So that's pretty limiting, huh? Um, no, it's not limiting. If we're just talking about green leafy vegetables, just edible leaves, we're talking about over 1,000 plant species. So here's just a sampling of what I mean when I say green leafy vegetables. We've got arugula, beet greens, bok choy, Brussels sprouts, collard greens, cabbage, chard, chicory, dandelion, endive, escarole, iceberg lettuce counts, kale, kohlrabi, mustard greens, purslane, romaine, sorrel, spinach, tatsoi, turnip greens, watercress, and so many others. And of course, there's all the edible leaves and flowers and herbs, right? In my column for Veg News Magazine in the July, August 2008 issue, I go over a variety of edible flowers and the best way to eat the petals of these flowers. And some of them, some of these leaves are also edible. And then there's obviously all the herbs whose leaves we eat, right? Like parsley and sage and basil. But today I want to focus on just these larger green vegetables, if you will, these larger green leafy vegetables. And 
and I'll talk about half a dozen of them, I think about seven of them, ways to prepare them, ways to eat them, nutrients specific to them, etc. Now, I know that many people never eat greens at all, and I'm talking about greens other than broccoli, obviously. If you're eating broccoli, that's great, that's a start, because frankly, most people aren't eating any vegetables these days, you know, certainly fresh vegetables. So it's a start if you're eating broccoli and not dissing your consumption of broccoli, but certainly people are not consuming these really, really hyper nutrient greens that I really encourage you to try mostly because we weren't taught how to properly prepare these things they were either boiled to death and tasted gross or they were cooked improperly um, or overcooked and tasted bitter or they were covered in cream and butter sauces so you never really got a sense of the flavor of the greens themselves and of course covering them in saturated fat and cholesterol laden cream and butter sauces you really do negate the nutritional benefits of the greens themselves anyway so as always I just ask that we remain open to new experiences and I encourage you to try new greens in a variety of ways you may not like every single one but at least give them a try and you may find a couple that you like but you might also find that green leafy vegetables that you thought you didn't like you know once they're prepared properly it turns out you might like them after all I've seen this happen again and again so hopefully some of these suggestions will help and will give a whole new meaning to greening our lives and greening the world so let's go in alphabetical order and start with arugula. Arugula was eaten in ancient Rome. It goes back many, many centuries. It's also known as rocket arugula or rocket greens. It has a peppery and some say bitter taste and it's rich in vitamins A and C. It's rich in calcium. A half cup of arugula has 16 milligrams of calcium. Arugula can be eaten raw in salads or added to stir fries or soups or pasta sauces. It's pretty powerful on its own. So it's often mixed with my milder greens to produce kind of a a balance in the salad. It can also be sauteed in olive oil like most greens. And if you really don't like arugula, most any green can be substituted for it. The closest matches being Belgian endive or escarole or dandelion greens. But I suppose if you don't like arugula, then you might not like those. But that just gives you an idea of some other greens that are similar to it. It's very easy to grow. We have some in our garden. We have what we call a salad garden garden. Our salad garden is kind of this separate garden we have that is dedicated to primary salad ingredients. So we have a ton of different kinds of lettuce. We have arugula, we have spinach, we have chives and microgreens and green onions. And then in another garden, we have a variety of other things. We have carrots and chard and kale and collard greens. But we call this our salad garden because the basis of it is lettuce. And as we thin out certain lettuce plants, because we're eating the leaves, we continue continually plant new seeds so we're constantly rotating and are never out of lettuce greens and it works really well and we're able to eat salads from our garden pretty much every day it's pretty it's pretty awesome and if you're wondering what microgreens are microgreens are just small incarnations of salad greens or herbs or edible flowers or leafy vegetables there's like micro fennel or micro arugula or micro spinach picture miniature versions of these things or sprouts is what they kind of look like of, the, of these vegetables They're great as garnishes or as toppings and great mixed in salads. They're just really pretty. And they add little bursts of flavor or color to your salad or to whatever you use them on. And truth be told, they're actually really cute. So microgreens, they're very trendy right now, especially in California. That's not why I'm growing them. I just think they're really cute and they're fun to grow and easy to grow. So those are microgreens. So back to arugula. You can toss arugula into a pasta dish. You can add it as a pizza topping. And I would add it kind of at the end of cooking time if you're making a pizza. Just kind of add it at the very end, the last five minutes or so of of cooking. Another thing you can do with arugula is make arugula pesto using arugula instead of basil. It's really quite quite good. I have a basil pesto recipe on my website and it will be in my new book, but pesto is basically just basil or arugula in this case with garlic cloves and olive oil, pine nuts or walnuts and some salt. The name is derived from the fact that it was originally made in a mortar and pestle by hand, but I recommend using a food processor. Unless you have a lot of time on your hands, then you can do it by hand in a mortar and pestle, but Food processors work really well for something like that. So that's 
arugula okay the next green i want to talk about is collard greens collard greens date back to prehistoric times they have a spinach like flavor they're actually a member of the cabbage family and they're closely related to kale in fact the ancient greeks um grew kale and collards and they made no distinction between them so they're very very similar in many ways collards are also extremely rich in nutrients one cup of cooked collard greens provides four grams of protein a huge amount of vitamin a like 700 micrograms which is over 800 percent of the daily recommendation lots of vitamin a over 100 percent of the daily recommendation again for one cup of cooked collard greens about 35 milligrams of vitamin c lots of lots of good stuff just a ton of good stuff in collard greens now collard greens have been cooked and used for centuries, but they became very popular in the southern United States. And I want to address this briefly. Collard greens became very popular among African Americans and are continued to be cooked today, especially in the cuisine known as soul food in this kind of southern African American cuisine. And you know, I may have said this before, that I'm very interested when people talk about the traditional style of cooking and how they can never cook without ham hocks or pig fat or lard or whatever they're talking about when it comes to animals. And I've said before, I don't care what your background is, most of us can claim heavy meat consumption in our culture, whatever the culture is, whether you're Irish or Mexican or Spanish or German or African American. But if you go back to the original cuisine, the original staples of that culture, you'll find that meat was not a staple. Meat was certainly not a main staple in these cuisines. So I think it's worth noting that collard greens did not originate in Africa, anywhere in Africa. The southern style of cooking greens came with the arrival of African slaves to the southern colonies and the need to satisfy their hunger and provide food for their families. The slaves of the plantations were given the scraps from the plantation kitchen and the slaves had to make do with what they were given, which often consisted of, you know, like the tops of turnips or the leaves of vegetables that the slave owners didn't eat. The scraps also consisted of the parts of the animal that were deemed unappetizing, such as pig's feet or pig's cheeks or pig's knuckles or ham hocks, which are basically a portion of the pig where the leg and the foot meet. This is the craft that slaves were forced to create meals from. So when people say, well, you have to honor people's traditions and meat and ham hocks and pig fat or whatever is a big part of African American or Southern cuisine, and I'm supposed to honor that, I would rather honor their healthier traditions that go farther back to their native countries of Africa, not in the dishes that they devised from the scraps of the slave masters. That's my personal opinion. I could be wrong. So I just think it's worth mentioning that about collard greens because they're such a huge staple in African American cuisine. And that's fantastic. But don't tell me that I'm doing something wrong by cooking collard greens in something other than animal fat. I'd rather see everybody do that for a number of reasons. Now, I also think it's important to keep in mind that these parts of the pig were not edible. As they were devising ways to cook with the scraps they got, they, they used these parts of the pig to add flavor to whatever they were cooking. And this obviously can be done without the use of body parts of pigs. The main components that make up the flavor of ham, as you know, are salt, fat, and smokiness, a smoky flavor from the curing of the flesh. So one thing you could do is add salt or add fat in the form of vegetable oil or add liquid smoke or all of the above. So that's that. I think we talked about liquid smoke before. Liquid smoke is just basically the condensation that comes from burning certain f kinds of wood like mesquite or hickory and it just uh, has this smoky flavor and it's not toxic. People always think that there's like something toxic about liquid smoke. I wouldn't recommend anything toxic to you. So just try liquid smoke. A little bit goes a long way. You can get this in the kind of a general grocery store. You wouldn't really find this in a health food store and you'd find it by the barbecue sauces or the ketchup. So check out liquid smoke and add it to something like split pea soup or the collard greens or mustard greens or anything like that where you want to add a smoky flavor. Now, in terms of what you're looking for when choosing collard greens, look for firm, unwilted leaves that are deep green in color. It's almost an olive color with no signs of yellowing or browning. 
and collard greens are so beautiful. They're just beautiful, huge leaves. Now, smaller leaves will be more tender, of course, and a little less bitter, a little more mild. But the big leaves, they're just, they're just absolutely gorgeous. We also grow collard greens and like all greens, they're super easy to grow, but you do have to keep your eye on them if you garden organically as we do so that the buggers don't take over. Um, you just check the undersides of the leaves continually to make sure that there's no aphid eggs and you just spray off those eggs or you pick them off as you see them. And this is a daily ritual that I perform. I'm also experimenting with a diluted mixture of tobacco and cayenne pepper, which apparently deters the aphids. So I'll let you know how that goes. Now, like with any greens or really any vegetables, you store unwashed collard greens in a damp paper towel in a plastic bag. They should be placed in the refrigerator crisper in the drawer in the refrigerator where they'll keep for about three to five days. The sooner they're eaten, the less bitter they'll be. And that goes for all Pretty much all vegetables, especially the leafier ones like lettuce. I talk, I know, a lot about preparing things in advance, cutting things in advance. There are certain vegetables you should not do this with because you'll just break down the cell walls and they just wilt a lot sooner. And then also when you're wetting them and then store them in the refrigerator, you're just breaking them down a lot sooner. So with the green leafy vegetables, don't wash them until you're about to use them, okay? Now some tips for preparing collard greens. Collard greens should be washed very well. Like a lot of these green leafies, the, um, sand or soil can kind of culminate in the leaves. And so you just, you know, you can either wash them under some running water and just really scrub them and kind of, you know, make sure you get them pretty clean. Or you can place the collard greens in a large bowl of water and you just kind of swish them around with your hands, which allows the sand to become dislodged. And you can do this a couple times, you know, remove the leaves from the water, empty the bowl, refill with clean water and repeat this process until no dirt remains. And you can do this. You can do that kind of thing with all the greens, whether they're whole leaves or you've already chopped them up. You can do that. In terms of preparing collards, as I said, one of the most traditional ways to cook these collard greens is to boil or simmer very slowly um, with a piece of pig, but we're not going to use pig. I recommend using liquid smoke to this same effect to get the same effect without harming anybody and the salt and the smokiness adds flavor but it also tempers the tough texture of the collard greens and it kind of smooths out their bitter flavor so they're cooked for you know kind of like 40 minutes just simmered for a long time until they're very soft and they're typically served with fresh baked corn bread which is dipped into what is called pot liquor Pot liquor is the highly concentrated, very vitamin-rich broth that results from the long boil of these greens. It is, in other words, the liquor that's left in the pot, and then you would dip the cornbread into this liquor. You can cook collard greens by boiling or steaming them and then just drizzling them with some olive oil or lemon juice. You can serve steamed collard greens with black-eyed peas and brown rice for a southern-inspired meal. Traditionally, collards are served with black-eyed peas on New Year's Day, which promises a year of good luck and financial reward. The greens are supposed to represent the paper money and the peas are supposed to represent coins. You can use lightly steamed collard greens as a wrap instead of using a tortilla or a nori sheet. I frequently make nori wraps, filling it with shredded vegetables, but a collard greens leaf would work really well as well. You just steam it and then you would roll into it whatever vegetables and whatever sauce you like and it, and it works well as a wrap. And you can also saute collard greens with tofu or garlic, crushed chili peppers, etc, etc, etc. So there's lots of things you can do with collard greens. So moving on to our next green, dandelion greens. In much of the northern hemisphere, dandelion is a perennial and persistent lawn weed, but you can weed and get a dose of your greens at the same time. You can seriously harvest the greens that are growing around your house, but don't eat them if your lawn is chemically treated or if your neighbor's lawn is chemically treated. But if you know that the area around your house is pesticide free, grab a paring knife and hunt for the greens. Look for small leaves about three to five inches in length. Now traditionally the dandelion would be harvested before flowering and eaten as an early spring green. The commercial varieties now are bred to be much leafier and less bitter and bigger too. And you can find dandelion greens pretty much in any grocery store. Dandelion greens tend to have a bitter kind of tangy flavor. They're also rich in vitamin A, rich in vitamin C, 
calcium. There's about 50 milligrams of calcium per half cup. In fact, there's even more iron and calcium in dandelion greens than there is in spinach. Now, I thought you might be interested in the etymology of the word. I know I'm interested in the etymology of words. The English name dandelion is a corruption of the French dentelion, meaning lion's tooth, and it refers to the coarsely toothed leaves. So if you've ever seen a dandelion leaf, you know, it's kind of jagged, and that's where that word comes from. These leaves, which we're referring to, these, these leaves is what we eat when we say dandelion greens. They can be eaten, cooked, or raw. Usually the young leaves and the unopened buds of the flower can be thrown into salads. Um, the older leaves tend to be cooked. Raw leaves do have a slightly bitter taste. They're probably closest in character to mustard greens, which we'll talk about in a bit. Eaten raw, they're wonderful tossed into salads. Like I said, they add spice. Um, you can lightly boil them, sprinkle them with some salt, a bit of cider vinegar, apple cider vinegar, to have a nice side dish. In France, where dandelion greens are still pretty popular, they're often lightly sautéed with garlic and salt, and they can be used as a substitute for spinach or Swiss chard or kale. I mean, all of these are pretty, pretty interchangeable. Again, garlic, olive oil, a little salt, a little red pepper flakes, and you're good to go with most of these greens. So don't diss the dandelions. Dandelions get such a bad rap. They're a valuable little green that are they're good for you and they're and they're yummy. And of course the flowers are great for bees. Bees love dandelion flowers. So those are dandelion greens. And moving on to kale. I don't want to talk about kale too much because I obviously talked about it a bit in the five favorite foods episode and I believe I've even talked about it in other places but kale is a member of the cabbage family like broccoli and cauliflower and brussels sprouts and it's incredibly nutritious which I talk about in that other episode what I'd like to talk about now that I didn't talk about in that episode are the different types of kale there are a lot of different types of kale there's black palm kale also known as lacinato or dinosaur kale other popular kale varieties include Red Russian, Siberian, Red Ursa, White Russian, Dwarf Blue Curled Scotch, Conserva, Red Boar, Winter Boar, Premier, and Star Boar. To whittle it down to make it easy, there are essentially just two types of kale. There's curly kale and there's flat-leafed kale. I like both equally well, and I use them for different things. One thing I can tell you is that I tend to remove the leaves from the thick stem of the curly kale variety, but I do tend to eat the leaves and the stem in the flat leaf variety, like the, like the lacinato or the dinosaur kale. Now, when buying kale, same thing. Keep the leaves in the crisper, in the refrigerator, because you know all of these all of these greens break down pretty quickly if they're kept in warm temperatures for too long. So keep it in a nice, crisp, cool place, and wash them thoroughly also before eating them. But wash them just before eating. Don't store them. I know I've talked about what to do with kale in a couple other episodes. I put it in virtually everything. A couple quick things you can do with kale. You can saute kale, like I said, with garlic and olive oil and sprinkle some lemon juice on it before serving. You can braise chopped kale with apples and before serving, just sprinkle with some balsamic vinegar and chopped walnuts. You can combine chopped kale with pine nuts and chopped olives with a whole grain pasta drizzled with olive oil. You can add some kale to your smoothie. You can add kale to when you juice. You can add kale to a tofu scramble. You can add kale to pasta sauces. I mean, there are so many wonderful things you can do with kale. Just be creative and just try to get these greens into, you know, everything you're eating. Um, maybe not everything you're eating. I don't know. Kale and chocolate go very well. But just try to get them into your repertoire. Now, let's move on to mustard greens. I mentioned mustard greens above. They have a hot, kind of spicy flavor. And like kale, they have an obscene amount of vitamin K. They have lots of vitamin A, lots of vitamin C, folate, fiber, and a good amount of protein. There's about three grams of protein in one cup of cooked mustard greens. There are a variety of mustard greens as well, like the kale. But for our purposes, when I say mustard greens, I'm talking about what's called southern mustard or American mustard greens. It's sold as mature greens and it looks like a kind of a 
more delicate version of kale. The leaves are kind of a jade green, a little lighter green that are crinkled and ruffled on the on the edges, but they're a little more tender than kale. And yes, mustard, the condiment comes from mustard, the plant. The mustard plant produces the brown seeds that are used to make Dijon mustard. Now, mustard greens are definitely the most pungent of all the greens. And again, there's kind of a peppery, spicy flavor. And they originated in the Himalayan region of India more than 5,000 years ago. And they're really versatile. You can see mustard greens in French cuisine and Chinese cuisine and Southern United States cuisines. They make great additions to salads. All of these greens can be used in salads and eaten raw. You just probably want to chop them up pretty finely. You can add mustard greens to a soup. You can saute them in olive oil with some walnuts and some lemon juice. As with all of the greens, acid cuts the bitterness. I keep talking about lemon juice on these greens. If you find that these greens are too bitter for you, a little acid just really cuts that bitterness. So try some orange juice or lime juice or lemon juice or tomatoes on any of these greens while you're cooking them. And while you're doing that, if you remember, you're also increasing your ability to absorb the iron in the greens. You can add chopped mustard greens to a pasta salad to give it a little kick or cook them the way I recommended cooking the collard greens just cook them down for a long time with a dash of liquid smoke. Generally, I would remove the leaves from the thick stem of the mustard greens as well. But if you're cooking them for a long time, like in a soup or like as you would cook the collard greens, you can actually leave the stem on. And you can also serve these mustard greens with um, beans and rice, just like you serve the collard greens. Now, let's move on to spinach. I was tempted to eliminate spinach from our discussion, but that wouldn't be very fair. But most people think of spinach when they think of green leafy vegetables, and I wanted to encourage you to think of others. Nothing wrong with spinach. Spinach is a great leafy green. It tends to have a sweet flavor. It's also rich in vitamins K and A and C and iron and, of course, all the phytochemicals. I don't think my mom served spinach much when I was growing up. I think she may have made it for my dad. My dad liked it, um, you know, like frozen spinach. He gets most of his vegetables, unfortunately, still from the freezer, and then he boils them, unfortunately. And I think that's how he ate it when I was growing up. Thankfully, my mom did not make me eat boiled spinach when I was growing up, but and I can definitely say that I did not have spinach raw, you know, as a salad until I was an adult. And I know that for sure. And I think it's one of the best ways to have spinach, in my opinion, either the baby leaf spinach or just the regular spinach. I love just spinach as a salad tossed with some balsamic vinegar, some toasted pecans, and some cranberries in, in the fall or raspberries in the summer. You can add some other sweet things like mandarin oranges and or even just a little bit of a seasoned rice vinegar. I also make a killer Greek spinach salad with balsamic vinegar and sun-dried tomatoes and olives and tofu crumbled on like feta cheese. Cooked, I don't really love spinach. I wouldn't just eat a plate of kind of boiled spinach on its own. I like spinach cooked as a part of a larger dish, like part of my tofu scramble or part of my tofu spinach lasagna or my tofu veggie quiche or my penne pasta with veggies, that kind of thing. The texture of the cooked spinach can be well, it can be soggy, and I like it in those dishes. It kind of complements the other textures um, pretty well. So those are my favorite ways to eat spinach, either raw as the main salad component or certainly as one of the many greens in a salad or cooked as part of a larger dish. And remember, like with most greens, especially spinach, spinach shrinks substantially when you cook it. So if a recipe calls for a cup or two of raw spinach and it seems to overflow and not fit in the pan, just give give it a few minutes because when it cooks, it will shrink a lot and wash spinach very well in the same way that I mentioned washing the other greens. And I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but there are other kinds of greens. There's lamb's quarters and fat hen. I don't know why animals are involved in that. I remember the first time I saw lamb's quarters on a menu and I was like, what are lamb's quarters? It's horrible. It's just a green. So lamb's quarters and fat hen, they're common garden weeds actually, and they're great spinach substitutes when they're young. So you can try those as well if you want something more exotic. And finally, we get to Swiss chard. I must say that next to kale, Swiss chard is my second favorite green 
pretty close second. I absolutely love chard and we grow chard as well. Chard is also really easy to grow. All these greens are so easy to grow. You just have to, again, look for the buggers. Leaf miners are pretty prevalent on Swiss chard and you just look for the eggs as they form on the backs of the leaves and just wipe them away with your hand. And the other concern is actually some of our Swiss chard plants right now are getting kind of eaten alive by earwigs. Earwigs are destructive little buggers and, and they're very persistent. So you can also deter earwigs by placing a rolled up newspaper that it's wet at night in the garden and the earwigs love to crawl into this dark, moist place. And then the next morning you can go out and retrieve all the earwigs in the newspaper and just relocate them to a different part of your yard. Thank you very much. So those are just some tips for adding Swiss chard to your garden. So yeah, I love Swiss chard. It's a beautiful, beautiful plant. It's absolutely delicious. Chard has beautiful, shiny, green ribbed leaves with stems that range from white or yellow or red, depending on the cultivar. Often at farmer's markets, at least around here, you'll see rainbow chard, which combines all of these colors. And there is nothing prettier than a bunch of rainbow chard with the green and the red and the pink and the yellow and the white. In fact, there's nothing prettier than seeing a farmer's market stand just of rainbow chard. Just imagine, just rainbow chard. It's just fantastic. So chard belongs to the same family as beets and spinach, and it's similar in taste to both of these. It has the kind of the bitterness of, of, of the beet greens and the slightly kind of salty flavor of the spinach leaves. Both the leaves and the stalk are edible, uh, although the stems vary in texture. The white ones tend to be the most tender. Chard is also packed with vitamins K, A, and C, has lots of E, fiber, folate, calcium, iron, potassium. You get the idea. Interestingly enough, Swiss chard is not native to Switzerland. But the Swiss botanist Koch determined the scientific name of this plant in the 19th century. And since then, its name has honored his homeland. Chard actually originated in the Mediterranean region. And even Aristotle wrote about chard in the 4th century BC. The ancient Greeks and later the Romans honored chard for its medicinal properties. They were such smarty pants back then. They knew what was going on. Chard actually gets its name from another Mediterranean vegetable called cardoon, which is a celery-like plant with thick stalks that resemble those of chard and again you would clean chard the same way I suggested cleaning the other greens dunk them in a bowl swish them around dry them off and prepare them any way you like as far as my favorite way to prepare them my favorite recipe is the one that I mentioned in the beginning of the episode the one that I'm teaching in my upcoming cooking class basically I caramelize onions and this is going to be in the new cookbook you just, and it's going to be in the recipe packet when the class is over with. So you don't have to wait until spring of 09 for the new cookbook to come out. Basically, you caramelize onions. If you don't know how to caramelize onions, you just slice a couple of onions, throw them in a saute pan with some earth balance, a non-dairy butter or, or olive oil, and some salt. And a tablespoon of sugar. And so basically you cook these onions until they start to get brown and, and their sugar start to come out and they get really sweet and fantastic and wonderful. And you can do this for about 20 or 30 minutes, depending on how many onions you're using. So once you caramelize the onions, then you add a bunch of chard that's been finely chopped, like chopped really well. And then you add some capers and some chopped Kalamata olives, some salt, a little balsamic vinegar, if you want a little kind of a little sprinkling of that and a squeeze of lemon. So fantastic. And my favorite way to eat this is as a topping for pizza. You would just put it on the pizza dough just like that and throw it in the oven and you have a fantastic topping for pizza. Chard is also great sauteed. Well, obviously an olive oil and garlic and lemon juice, and then you can add it to pasta. It can be used again, um, chopped finely as a replacement for spinach and the tofu spinach lasagna that I mentioned. It's on my website on one of the packets online. And you can also use raw chard in salads. Again, chop it finely. So much to say about greens, but I have run out of time and I have run out of breath. So I got nothing else to say about greens. Hopefully I'll see you in my cooking class coming up when we talk all about greens and eat some delicious greens together. May you find abundance in the thousand edible leaves available to us and health in their healing properties. And may you find solace in the awareness that no animal need be killed so that we may live. This is Colleen with Compassionate Cooks. Thanks for listening. <laughs>